Hello and welcome to the Aquarium. Come in and take a seat, the show is about to begin. If you were to ask 100 people to think of a fossil, a high proportion of those people would probably describe to you an ammonite. Their fossils are extremely common and can be bought pick and mix style from most fossil gift shops. Their fossils have been known about for thousands of years. The ancient Greeks gave the name ammonite to this fossil because its coiled shape resembles the horns of the ram-headed Egyptian god Amun. In folklore, ammonites are snake stones, a plague of snakes supposedly turned to stone by Christian saint Hilda of Whitby, and this is why you might see ammonites with carved snake heads in museum collections or fossils featured in stained glass windows. Ammonites belong to a group of sea animals known as cephalopods, which today include their relatives the octopus, squid, cuttlefish and nautilus. It was nearly 500 million years ago that the first cephalopods appeared in the ancient seas. From primitive organisms, they gradually evolved into highly successful species, with the ammonites becoming most prolific during the Mesozoic 250 to 65 million years ago. Ammonites have been studied intensively for the last 200 years, but between experts there is very little agreement what ammonites looked like or how they worked as living organisms. Could they float? Did they swim? How do they catch their food? How long do they live? Why do they disappear at the end of the Cretaceous? All these questions remain essentially unresolved. Although the fossilized shells of the ammonites occur in huge numbers, almost nothing is known of their soft parts, apart from possible outlines of digestive organs and ink sacs, which in very rare cases have been preserved. While no evidence of tentacles has been found, it can be assumed that ammonites were similar to the modern cephalopods such as nautilus and squids. Despite thousands of scientific studies on ammonite fossils, most scientific papers mention very little about ammonite anatomy or ecology. Most papers concentrate on questions of primary taxonomy. In other words, is this ammonite different from others so far known? How is it related? How can it be identified and where is it found? The reason most scientists concentrate on these questions above all others comes down to the usefulness of ammonites in biostratigraphy. Many ammonite species evolved and died out within a fairly short period of time, perhaps a few hundred thousand years, but our fossils are often abundant and, most crucially of all, often very widely distributed. So if a particular ammonite species can be found in sediments at two different localities, it's a good indication that those two sediments were laid down within the same rather narrow period of time. Most aspects of the ammonite's physical appearance and behaviour are arrived at due to comparisons with a modern-day nautilus. Despite the similar physical appearance, the ammonite is actually closer related to the octopus and the squid, but the nautilus can give us many clues as to the life behaviours of ammonites. Many ammonites probably lived in the open water of the ocean, rather than at the sea bottom, because their fossils are often found in rocks laid down under conditions where no bottom-dwelling life is found. Many of them are thought to have been good swimmers, with flattened, discus-shaped, streamlined shells, although some ammonites were less effective swimmers and were likely to have been slow-swimming bottom dwellers. An ammonite shell has internal chambers which increase in size as they rotate around a central point. The largest chamber with its open aperture would have contained the ammonite's body. As the animal grew bigger, it secreted minerals to enlarge the aperture while at the same time sealing off part of the shell behind its body, thereby creating a new chamber. There are many different shell types with different arrangements of ribs, spines and whorls. Those with thick ribbed shells were likely to have been slow-moving bottom dwellers. Fossil evidence indicates that their diet included mollusks, crustaceans which lived on the sea floor. These ammonites were themselves preyed upon by larger predators and have been found showing teeth marks from such attacks. Having strongly ribbed and thick shells, sometimes with protective spines, would certainly have increased their chances of survival. They may also have escaped from an attack by squirting ink, much as modern cephalopods do. Ammonites with flattened, discus-shaped streamline shells are thought to have been fast-moving hunters, which fed on various marine creatures including fish and even their own kind. An attack probably involved stalking their prey, then rapidly extending tentacles to grasp the victim, which would have been torn apart by strong, parrot-like jaws. These are believed to have been located between the eyes at the base of the tentacles. Ammonites may be found in many sizes, ranging from millimetres to metres. The ammonites here in Ark are probably based on one of the largest species known, the Parapazosia. 
This huge ammonite lived during the Lower Campanian epoch of the Late Cretaceous period in marine environments in what is now Westphalia in Germany. The largest specimen was found in Germany in 1895 and measures 1.8 metres, that's about 5.9 feet across. Incredibly, the shell is incomplete and would have been much bigger in life. The larger segment of the shell, which would have been the body chamber, is missing, and as is common in most ammonite shells. This part of the shell was weaker than the sealed flotation part, and presumably predators would often crush the body chamber while getting to the meaty bit inside. If complete, the enormous size of the Parapososia shell is estimated to be up to 3.5 metres, that's about 11 foot in diameter, and could have weighed up to 1,455 kilograms, that's about 3,208 pounds. A fully grown Parapososia probably had little to fear in the oceans, apart from perhaps the biggest of marine reptiles, such as Mosasaurus, which due to its huge size probably had the bite strength to tackle the enormous shell. During their evolution, the Amalites faced no less than three catastrophic events that would eventually lead to their extinction. The first event occurred in the Permian about 250 million years ago, where only 10% survived. These surviving species went on to flourish throughout the Jurassic, however at the end of this period, about 206 million years ago, they faced near extinction when all but one species survived. This event marked the end of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic, during which time the number of Amalite species grew once more. The final catastrophe occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period, when all species were annihilated and the Amalites became extinct. This event apparently coincided with the death of the dinosaurs. Well that's all I have for you this week, as always I hope you've enjoyed the video and you've learned something new. If you did, please let me know by leaving a like and a comment down below. And I hope you come back next time here at the Aquarium when we'll be looking at the Dunkleosseus. Until next time, goodbye.